this is an interesting image that reminded me of some of these new intrasacular devices that we um, use to treat aneurysms. And this is in the San Francisco airport. I was out there recently and uh, I looked up and saw this art display and I thought it looks like something that's coming out of a neck of an aneurysm and it's an intrasacular device. And I'll show you some of these new devices that we're using. Um, so these are my disclosures, nothing relevant to the talk today. I'm going to try to figure out all the technology. Um, so our learning objectives, I'll review the natural history of unruptured intracranial aneurysms. We'll look at some of the complexities of aneurysm angioarchitecture that I think um, put some of the challenges with both open surgical and endovascular treatment options. There's still some aneurysms that really can't be treated. They're sort of like runaway trains that no matter what we do, they continue to grow and they cause significant problems for patients. Um, I'll review what I think are some of those concerning anatomical features, especially in the unruptured population when we get referrals for small aneurysm versus larger aneurysms and when we're actually concerned about an aneurysm rupturing. And then some of the new treatment options and advancements in the field. I'm probably gonna run through some of the slides very quickly because there's numerous slides and I'll get to some of the case samples. Um, so when we speak about unruptured intracranial aneurysms, the vast majority of these are asymptomatic. They're an incidental finding. A lot of patients come to ER, they have sinus headaches, they have sinusitis, they have dizziness. There's so many reasons why patients are being scanned these days. With advanced imaging, CT angiography, so many patients that are screened for TIAs end up having CT angiography of their cranial vessels. And we typically find small aneurysms that are incidental findings. We probably get five to six referrals a week for an 85 year old female with a two millimeter cavernous aneurysm. Those would occupy a lot of your time if you saw every single one of them, as opposed to a 35 year old female with Erlos Danlos that has a six millimeter aneurysm and it's growing. So we sort of have to wean through a lot of the referrals and figure out what is actually somebody that has an aneurysm that's potentially gonna cause them problems. Unruptured intracranial aneurysms can become symptomatic if they rupture and cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, but they can also become symptomatic through mass effects. And usually they, these patients present with cranial neuropathy. So typically troubles with extraocular movements is a very common thing or optic nerve compression with large ophthalmic aneurysms. And then headaches. Um, our worst case scenario is patients that actually present with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, rupture, and we know that these patients can present in deep coma or they can actually be sitting up and talking to us. So there's a huge variation in how patients present clinically with intracranial aneurysms. Um, we use various scales to sort of determine especially when somebody's come in ruptured, um, whether there's somebody that should be treated urgently or whether we should maybe consider no treatment at all. So somebody that comes in in a deep coma that's a Hunt and Hess 5 or a WFNS 5 that has an external ventricular drain put in and shows really no improvement, we typically don't treat those patients. The patients that have some clinical improvement and they're worth salvaging definitely go on to treatment. So as I said, Unruptured intracranial aneurysms can be symptomatic. Here's an example of a large cavernous aneurysm. And you can see that in the arterial phase here, the aneurysm fills, but it still shows opacification well into the venous phase. So this is like having a large left atrial appendage in your brain. This will easily form a clot and be a risk factor for ischemic stroke. Patients with large ACOM aneurysms can present with at a psychiatric facility um, with significant behavioral changes due to mass effect in the frontal lobes. Um, so we see, again, mass effect from unruptured, large, partially thrombosed aneurysms. Obviously, the worst case scenario with any aneurysm is the fear of rupture. And then we look at the natural history of aneurysms to determine what aneurysms are at the highest risk of rupture. And traditionally, it's been always this theory that the larger an aneurysm is, and if it's in the posterior cerebral circulation, it probably has the highest risk of rupture to the patient. When we see this pattern of subarachnoid hemorrhage on any scan in ER, it's aneurysmal until proven otherwise. And 85% of patients with this pattern of hemorrhage 
when you do a CTA, you'll find an aneurysm. There's about 10 to 15% of patients with a CTA with this pattern of hemorrhage that you won't find an aneurysm. They should go on to have a digital subtraction angiography, so a catheter angiogram. If it's more of a perimesencephalic pattern of hemorrhage, we typically don't do cerebral angiograms for those patients. I'm a pitcher's guy, so I think of when aneurysms rupture, favorable outcome, Dr. Lowney always taught me about the rule of thirds, and I think he adopted that from Dr. Drake, um, who trained him, is that a third of patients will pass away immediately and be found at home, um, unfortunately passed away. A small percentage of patients that make it to the hospital will either die in hospital or be severely disabled. And that's from the initial rupture. There's other things that happen after an aneurysm ruptures that will increase morbidity and mortality, such as hydrocephalus and basal spasm. So we, as I said, patients roughly about 15 to 30% will die before they come to hospital and another 15 to 20% will die in hospital. Um, the risk of re-rupture is about 4% um, in the first 24 hours and roughly about 20% in the first two weeks. We know that if an aneurysm re-ruptures, that carries about an 80% risk of severe um, morbidity and mortality. So being very disabled and not being able to live at home. I basically just said that on that slide. Um, using these various scales, the Hunt and Hess scores, their clinical grading when they come in, Using a Fisher score really helps us determine who's at high risk of basal spasm and hydrocephalus. And putting all the scores together sort of determines how rapidly somebody should be treated. So if we look at aneurysm rupture risk, I'm showing you aneurysms in different locations of the brain. Um, so we can say that from the left of the screen to the right, there's smaller aneurysms. Some are in the posterior circulation, some are in the anterior circulation. I don't know if this actually works as a laser pointer, but people won't be able to see that on the screen. So here's a small pica aneurysm, and here's a fairly large PCOM aneurysm. This patient might have presented with a cranial neuropathy, a third nerve palsy, and then we just have increasing aneurysm size. So another important question we always want to know is, is it truly intradural? Is this aneurysm within the intracranial circulation, or is it on the carotid that feeds up to the intracranial circulation. So a truly extradural cavernous aneurysm. And those have, even though it's the largest aneurysm on this screen, it has the lowest risk of rupture. This aneurysm essentially has about a zero risk of rupture. This aneurysm will cause a compressive neuropathy with a cavernous sinus syndrome if it becomes symptomatic. If it ruptures, which is incredibly rare, those patients present with a direct CC fistula but they typically don't have subarachnoid hemorrhage. In rare circumstances, they can have subdural hematomas as this wall of this aneurysm erodes through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. So classification, I'm talking, and I've just showed you images of saccular aneurysms. So there's other types of aneurysms that we see. These are the classic, very saccular aneurysms that we look at. We actually understand the best in terms of natural history. Fusiform aneurysms um, typically have a very low risk of rupture. What they typically do is they cause perforator infarct, especially in the vertebral basilar system. Dissecting pseudoaneurysms, depending on age in children, these can happen from varicella, other viral infections in both the middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery. And then mycotic aneurysms from people with infective endocarditis tend to be on distal vessels. So in terms of classification, aneurysms have generally been classified as small, large, or giant. Um, and, and when we look at natural history data, they've been further categorized as less than from zero to seven, from seven to 12, and 12 to 24, and then giant aneurysms are these large aneurysms that, as I said, are sort of like a freight train that are out of control. They also have the highest risk of rupture, as well as causing cranial neuropathy. If we look at the pathophysiology, we always talk about hemodynamic stress. So these tend to occur at branch points in the intracranial circulation. So they commonly occur at the MCA bifurcation, the anterior communicating artery, and the basilar apex, where you see 
a branch point. And that creates this shear stress and, and changes in hemodynamics on the vessel wall that eventually results in an outpouching. When you look at the pathology of a blood vessel from a ruptured aneurysm, what you see is that they lack an internal elastic lamina. So the vessel itself is weak. And then when you grow a daughter sac off of already a, a weakened wall, that's an increased vulnerability of the aneurysm rupturing. So when there's a bilobed aneurysm or another sac that develops off of an already weakened wall, it becomes typically a rupture point. In terms of location, the vast majority of intracranial aneurysms that are truly intradural occur in the anterior circulation. So the MCA, the anterior communicating artery, and classically in terms of natural history, the ventral wall of the distal part of the intracranial supraclinoid ICA, where the posterior communicating artery is, those aneurysms have a higher risk of rupture and they've been categorized as posterior communicating. Um, but the majority of aneurysms occur in the anterior circulation. In the posterior circulation, as I said, with size, they have an increased risk of rupture. They occur, we say, anywhere from 2 to 6% of the population. But if you're in Finland, Japan, or northern Canada, Inuit populations, these are much higher prevalence in certain ethnic populations. They occur a little bit more commonly in females than males, and they tend to occur in your fifth to sixth uh, decade of life. If you have a connective tissue disorder like polycystic kidney disease, that definitely increases your risk of developing an aneurysm. We often see about 20 to 30 percent of patients on their initial CT imaging will have more than one aneurysm. And we typically say that multiplicity or multiple aneurysms tend to occur more commonly in females, people with a positive family history of intracranial aneurysms and connective tissue disorders. Again, looking at the angioarchitecture of an aneurysm is really important when we look at the natural history, because this is now factored into some of the new scales when you look at saying who should be treated if you use the phases or the UAT score, you're looking at aneurysm morphology. So this aneurysm right here, which is a single lobule, has a much lower risk of rupturing than a really irregular shaped multi-lobulated aneurysm. Again, it's due to shear stress and hemodynamic forces that increase the risk of rupture. <clears throat> Then there's all these wonderful connective tissue disorders that you see in clinic. These patients typically have multiple aneurysms. When we look at rupture risk, um, it's sort of a lot of patients will say to us in clinic, um, I have this time bomb in my head. And we try to sort of talk them down from thinking that they have this severe, um, devastating thing that they're walking around with because they really stop living and there's a psychological component to what happens to some of these patients. And that's even incorporated into one of the treatment scales. Um, but the Dutch group has, have really looked at risk factors for aneurysm growth and rupture at, uh, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And what they found common to a lot of patients that have that harbor aneurysms or rupture an aneurysm is the three big risk factors are smoking, hypertension, and it's not just hypertension, it's really uncontrolled hypertension, as well as heavy alcohol consumption. There's a whole bunch of other things, but we really don't counsel patients on these other things. We break them up into modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, and we really focus on trying to change the modifiable risk factors in these patients. Dental hygiene has become a big issue in, in cerebral vascular disease as well as cardiovascular disease. So people, I've noticed since I'm a fellow that anyone that comes in with a ruptured aneurysm has the worst teeth I've ever seen. Um, and so the Finnish group who still clips a lot of aneurysms would take those aneurysms, send them to pathology and actually do PCR for bacterial DNA that are typically found uh, as oral uh, bacterial. And they find these in the wall of an aneurysm. So definitely poor oral hygiene increases your risk of, of rupture. Um, in terms of natural history, we have the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms. And they've really made it easy. So all of our residents learn this table. Again, I told you these sizes. You can see that it's broken up into anterior circulation, posterior circulation, then cavernous. And then increasing size increases the risk of rupture. 
And the initial table was published as a five-year risk of rupture. And so five-year risk of rupture of a large Basler aneurysm that's more than 25 millimeters is 50%. For an ICA aneurysm that's intradural, it's 40%. So very high risk of rupture. These smaller aneurysms, and this is what the majority of our referrals are four and five millimeter small aneurysms. And the thing is what to do with them because the issue with this data, natural history data, is we're probably looking at a different species of aneurysm. The aneurysms that come in ruptured are actually not a lot of these giant aneurysms. They're small four and five millimeter ACOM aneurysms. So there's a huge disconnect between what you see and follow in the clinic versus what actually comes in as a ruptured aneurysm. And this has been looked at closely that there is this increasing trend of smaller aneurysms that come in rupture and they probably have a different natural history or what it is is they're developing rapid, rapidly and then rupturing at a very rapid um, rate. And so that's this scenario D where you have an aneurysm that develops, it's small and it ruptures. Whereas typically what we see in the clinic is we get referred a small aneurysm over time that might grow and then it might rupture if we don't treat it. And then you see some aneurysms that grow, they continue to grow, they don't rupture, they might not cause any mass effects and you continue to follow them. And then you have an aneurysm that you follow, it stays static for many years and I have patients that I've followed for 10 years and they suddenly come in ruptured, something's changed. So we have this whole different spectrum of aneurysm. So it's trying to figure this out when you're in clinic, who really needs to come for treatment. And that's part of the difficulty. So other groups where aneurysms are much higher prevalence have looked at this closely. And um, we used to say that ACOM aneurysms had a low risk of rupture based on the Ishwa data. But some of the newer data from Japan, Finland would actually say that small ACOM aneurysms actually have a higher risk of rupture than what we think. So when I used to just follow five millimeter ACOMs, maybe I'm sort of, I should be treating some of these. And that's sort of what the data is showing in multiple uh, studies. But what it is with ACOM aneurysms is looking at an aneurysm that has an irregular shape or it's multilobulated. They're the ones that are at much higher risk of rupturing, even though they're less than seven millimeters. Our typical protocol is that if somebody first gets detected with an aneurysm to do a follow-up image, in six months. And if it grows even by a few millimeters from four millimeters to six millimeters, they've almost bought themselves treatment. If it stays static, then you can go on a, a more routine follow-up with typically MRA time of flight imaging. There's no radiation, no contrast required. Um, this irregular shape and morphology is generally what has been found to be an increased risk of rupture. So that's been incorporated into some of these scales, like the phases and the UAT score is actually looking at aneurysm morphology um, and using these scales to sort of determine who's really eligible for treatment or who we should be considering for treatment. For the most part, when I use the Ishwa data, because these scales are based on the natural history from Ishwa patients, um, you're still going to be cautious with treating small aneurysms. Especially, we all know that from being on call for many years, how many ruptured ophthalmics have you seen? It's very low versus ACOM. So there's aneurysms in certain places that you know have a higher risk of rupturing. So we'll talk about some of the management of aneurysm um, treatment. And so we're using natural history data to determine the five-year risk of rupture. We're also figuring out somebody's lifespan. So if I see somebody in clinic that's 50, their lifetime risk of rupture is much higher than when I see somebody that's 70. But so you're factoring all of this in to make decisions um, about rupture. And it's really just figuring out that risk. Am I more likely to harm the patient than the aneurysm? And if the answer to that is yes, and you can't beat natural history, you have no business touching the patient. Um, medical management of patients, as I said, those risk factors need to be controlled. Um, I could probably hand out lots of dental floss and probably save the healthcare system a lot of money or convince people to see a dentist, but controlling blood pressure, getting them to quit smoking and, and reduce alcohol intake can be very challenging. Um, then you get some of these really complex aneurysms where you say, 
what is the best way to treat this? Is it open surgery with clipping, bypass, maybe a combination of endovascular and open surgical options? Um, this is a young female that presents with headaches and seizures, and you find this on imaging. This is a dissecting pseudoaneurysm of her dominant hemisphere of a left superior MCA branch. Um, so you're concerned if this vessel is, is lost, then the patient's going to have significant motor and language disability. So it's trying to work the patient through, but then you're also trying to figure out what is the risk of this aneurysm rupturing or causing a stroke. It's quite high. So surgical clipping is a very robust treatment. Endovascular coiling, we saw the picture of Dr. Lowney. I think he went to UCLA to train, which is where the first coiling was done with back in the 1990s. Um, so it's only been sort of 30 years that um, endovascular options, and they've dramatically changed and improved even in the last decade with better catheters. But the concepts of open surgery, whether it's endovascular or open surgery, still remain the same. It's deconstructive or reconstructive techniques. And for open surgery, reconstruction is clipping, potentially bypass, deconstruction is parent vessel sacrifice. And Drake published a huge series on Hunterian ligation of 700 giant aneurysms, and he hand drew all of those aneurysms. It was quite amazing. So we know that parent vessel sacrifice deconstructive techniques work. For open surgery, as I said, um, bypass and trapping, this is sort of phasing out. In lots of places in Europe, even in North America, endovascular techniques and, and treatments have um, surpassed open surgery. And there isn't a lot of people that can still do um, open surgical bypass. So um, it's a lost art. Even our residents that train in neurosurgery, um, they haven't really had enough exposure during a, a full neurosurgery residency to say that they could safely go out and clip an aneurysm. It really requires a fellowship. And even in Canada, where can you do an open fellowship where you're going to get enough volume for surgical clipping and bypass? Um, yeah, here's a picture of Drake. You can't really talk about open surgical clipping without showing a picture of Charles Drake. Um, he drew these beautiful images of some of these giant thrombosed aneurysms. And it's interesting because disease repeats itself. So I see a lot of, when I look at the appendix of this paper, I'll show you aneurysms that look just like this one right here that I've recently treated endovascularly. And I, I have that case, but... Um, just different ways of treating as things evolve. So when we talk about devices for endovascular treatment of aneurysms, there's really an endosacular approach, which is what was done in the early 90s, which is putting coils into aneurysms. And then there's endoluminal, so parent vessel reconstruction. And I feel in a lot of aneurysms, it's the parent vessel that's diseased. So putting something in the sac, isn't really curing the problem. You're gonna have recurrences, regrowth. You might even have a whole new aneurysm develop beside where you've coiled a previous one. And then there's still some giant aneurysms where we'll do test occlusions and just sacrifice the vessel. And that's a very effective technique. And Dr. Drake showed that with open surgery, um, but you can do endovascular techniques, especially in the posterior circulation for dissecting pseudoaneurysms of the V4 segment of the vert is just coil occlude the vessel. Um, the way flotoverters work, and when we do endoluminal techniques, is they're acting as a scaffolding to lay down a new um, endothelial layer to reconstruct and, and, and remodel the diseased vessel. And this has become a very effective treatment, especially for really large giant aneurysms. It promotes aneurysm thrombosis, but at the same time, it's it's remodeling the parent vessel. And I think after using many flow diverters and different products on the market, I'm sort of more in tune with endoluminal reconstruction of parent vessels and less um, favoring endosacular techniques. Here's a nice video. Uh, I think that our folks from Medtronic might know this video, but um, this is just an example of an aneurysm being treated with an endoluminal device called a flow diverter. 
and it's deployed through very small microcatheters and the technology has really advanced. These first came to market and they were FDA approved in 2008, 2007, we started using them in Canada in back when I started my fellowship. And they were really first approved for aneurysms of the anterior circulation, mainly within the cavernous ICA up to the level of the ophthalmic. Distally for intracranial circulation, when flow diverters were first approved, they were not approved for posterior circulation or treating an MCA bifurcation aneurysm or an ACOM. As I said, surgical clipping is still very robust, and we have young patients that come in with complex ruptured MCA aneurysms, and they still go for clipping. We At our center, there's probably 25 to 30 clippings per year. And the majority of those aneurysms that are clipped are probably MCA bifurcation aneurysms. They typically have branches coming out of the dome and in a ruptured case to do endovascular techniques. They're quite, you're either under treating the aneurysm or you're, you're trying something more complex and you're increasing the risk to the patient when I think this is a very robust treatment. Um, in terms of where clipping is really done, I said Finland, it's huge. Um, the Philippines, parts of Asia, where the vast majority of aneurysms are still clipped. Whereas in places like France, there isn't too many people left that can clip an aneurysm. Um, residual aneurysm post-clipping, it's really just if there's a dysplastic parent vessel and you don't want to pinch or lose a bifurcation branch. So you have to leave a remnant and that can result over time in the aneurysm regrowing a new whole pleb or, or a daughter sac. Um, in terms of complications from surgical clipping, morbidity and mortality, it's really stroke is the biggest risk for losing a parent vessel um, or, or decreasing the caliber of vessel that results in a stroke. Um, there's other things like infection, um, subdural hematomas that can happen. Um, but we have similar complications that happen in endovascular techniques, stroke and hemorrhage, aneurysm rupture, intraprocedural uh, stroke and aneurysm rupture. So they're just slightly different. The difference though, is when you take younger versus older people for clipping versus coiling, you can see that the morbidity and mortality with increasing age doesn't really increase dramatically with endovascular techniques, whereas open surgery, it does. Um, so the, the biggest in, thing with complications from clipping are where the aneurysm is located. So ICA terminus, you have to worry about lenticulostrite, perforators being accidentally clipped or lost. Um, so again, it's perforator infarcts. Thank goodness this is a flow model that ruptured, but we did manage to rupture a flow model with pipeline course. Um, Again, complications in endovascular techniques are really ischemic and hemorrhagic. When I first started training, there would be certain individuals that would say, well, I'm not going to heparinize the patient until I have the first coil in there. Well, some aneurysms I treat, you're only putting in one coil. So you're actually, your thromboembolic complications in endovascular procedures are as high as 7 to 8%, whereas your hemorrhagic risks are only 1% to 2%. So I've always thought about this and my preference is to heparinize patients as soon as I have arterial access because you're more likely to have a stroke with an endovascular technique than you are to have hemorrhage. There's other things that can happen in terms of patients not being responsive to some of the antiplatelet agents we use and using more aggressive antiplatelets like switching from clopidogrel to ticagrelor has its own sort of increased risk of complications, especially in ruptured cases where the patient might require a new external ventricular drain or a VP shunt, and you're doing that on dual antiplatelets. We showed Drake. So this is the first endovascular treatment of aneurysms done in Russia by Servanenko, and they used detachable balloons. I mentioned UCLA development of, of coils, platinum coils to treat aneurysms to thrombose them. Drake had, before coils had even come up, he had taken um, horse hair from a horse's tail and fixed it in glued or aldehyde. And he used to try to put that into a giant aneurysm when he was clipping it to try to thrombose it, to increase the thrombosis of the aneurysm. So 
It's sort of like using an endovascular technique. It's putting something in the aneurysm to speed up thrombosis. And that's exactly what coils do. They really just thrombose the aneurysm. If there's enough of them by the parent vessel in the neck of the aneurysm, they'll endothelialize and they'll seal it off. So that they can remodel the artery, but to a limited degree. Um, there was a trial that actually looked at coiling versus clipping, and that's the ISAT trial. They randomized roughly 2,100 patients, and this was over 20 years ago, and this was all ruptured aneurysms. And what they found was that the absolute risk reduction between endovascular treatment with coiling and clipping favored patients going for endovascular treatment by roughly 7.5%. Um, the long-term data, again, shows that endovascular coiling, there wasn't a lot of re-ruptures. There are aneurysm remnants and recanalization that occurs, but they typically don't mean that the patient's going to re-rupture. So it's a robust treatment that in the long-term seems to last. They, a few centers have repeated that ISAT trial using better devices. So in 2010, the Barrow Group with Cameron McDougall, who's a Canadian from Saskatchewan neurosurgeon there that only practices endovascular um, treatment of aneurysms. But you have other big names on this paper, and those were the clippers, and then there was very experienced people doing endovascular techniques. So they eliminated some of the variability of saying, well, there was some non-experienced centers in ISAT, so this is a very experienced center. And they found an even bigger difference between endovascular coiling and clipping that favored endovascular therapy. Um, so again, just more data showing that endovascular treatment, and that's sort of how we've adopted things at our center when an aneurysm comes in and it's ruptured, they typically are considered for endovascular therapy first before clipping. Um, the treatments have improved because our access catheters have dramatically improved since the ISAT study. So back then, catheters were very stiff, microcatheters were limited, wires were a lot different than what they are now. So I think if you repeated some of these studies using better technology than what we have, you might see an even bigger difference. And so in terms of endovascular options, it's always how do you get to the aneurysm? So there's different access routes, but once you get there, you sometimes are faced with these loops in the carotid and the older, stiffer catheters would definitely cause problems for navigating through here. If you are very aggressive trying to navigate through this, you can cause a dissection. A lot of those iatrogenic di dissections caused by catheters really don't cause a lot of issues for the patients, but in some patients, it can be a huge problem just navigating and trying to get there. The newer distal access catheters make treatment much more uh, uh, feasible than what they were probably 10 to, to 20 years ago. So there's been huge advances. And some of the big advances are different endosacular devices. I'll show you the web device that we've used and then endoluminal devices with different types of flow diverters. So again, there's that picture of that patient. She ended up going for bypass and then endovascular trapping of the proximal segment. So a combined treatment by Dr. Lowney um, in London. There's balloon-assisted coiling. So when we look at the angioarchitecture of aneurysms, these wide neck aneurysms, it's hard to just do a primary coiling without having the, the coils drop down into the parent vessel. One of the disadvantages with balloon-assisted coiling is you're trapping a microcatheter in the aneurysm, so it doesn't have as much flexibility, so there's increased risk of intraprocedural rupture when you use a balloon-assisted coiling technique. The advantage of it is you can coil the aneurysm without leaving hardware in the parent vessel, so you don't need dual antiplatelet therapy. Stent-assisted coiling, again, for these really wide neck aneurysms that are difficult to keep coils in, act as a scaffolding so you decrease the size of the aneurysm neck. And with some of these really nice framing coils, you can keep a coil mass in the aneurysm. There's endoluminal techniques with flow diverters and then endosacular devices different from coils, such as the web device. These are some of the aneurysms that I've dealt with in the last little while. And these, I think the posterior circulation, because there's less and less of these being treated with open surgery. There's not many people that are going to clip this basler or any of these baslers. 
um, these days. There, there hasn't been a Basler clipping in Hamilton. I think Dr. Reddy did the last one probably in 2002. Um, so then if you're left with endovascular options for these aneurysms, how do you deal with an aneurysm like this that has a PCA and an SCA coming out of the dome? If you coil this all off, you're going to lose all of those vessels. The top of the basler is not going to fill. You're going to have a patient that's locked in. So you have to come up with different alternative options to try to save the parent vessel and decrease the risk of rupture. So I, I spoke to you about balloon-assisted coiling. Um, these new compliant balloons, you can see how this balloon herniates right down into the aneurysm, keeps the coil mass in there. This is an ACOM aneurysm coiling with a, a scepter balloon. And when you let the balloon down, you don't see herniation of the coil mass. There's other ways to do this with dual catheter technique without using a balloon. So we've come up with different ways to deal with wide neck aneurysms. Stents, the issues with stents is you have to use dual antiplatelet therapy. It's not as much of an issue in unruptured aneurysms. It's more of a concern for ruptured aneurysms. Sidewall aneurysms that are wide neck stents in the ICA seem to work well, but we've moved on to using flow diverters. So flow diverters would replace the treatment of coils and a braided stent here. A small aneurysm like this, or even a large aneurysm would probably be flow diverted. Larger aneurysms would be a combination of a flow diverting stent and coils. Getting into reconstructive techniques for Baslers that are very complex, you can see here, here's a Y stenting, there's T stenting configurations. There's just different ways that you can put two stents. Um, in Germany, they're putting two flow diverters side by side in the Basler, so it's like a double barrel. Um, it's again, you need a lot of case series and, and, and literature to say that this is actually a good thing to be doing. Otherwise, it's sort of a, it's experimentation and trying to figure out ways to deal with these complex aneurysms. So here's a case that we had a little while ago. Um, it's probably about five years back, and we've changed our philosophy how we would do this. But this patient has both PCAs and this wide neck basler. <clears throat> You could potentially put a web in there. This was just at the time that web had come out. Um, you can put a stent from the Basler into one PCA. And I typically think that the best way to treat these is to turn a bifurcation aneurysm into a sidewall aneurysm. And the way you would do that is if you have a big PCOM, you occlude one origin of a P1 so that you basically then have a flow diverter from a P1 down into the basler and you coil off the whole thing, including the origin of the P1 on the opposite side because it will fill through a PCOM. If you don't, you have no PCOMs and you have to keep this as a bifurcation aneurysm. My feeling is that these things are like runaway trains. We never ever successfully cure them. They keep growing and they develop what I call a coiloma. And I'll show you examples of that, where it's this massive lesion that's compressing the thalamus and the brainstem. And eventually those patients become bed bound and very disabled. This patient, we actually decided that we'd go from a transcirculation approach from the carotid and put a, <clears throat> I must've used up the battery. Um, put a stent from one P1 to the other P1 and then coil occlude the aneurysm. So there's just the injections of both the carotid and, um, and filling of the basler system through a carotid injection or both simultaneous. And then we're going to actually travel through the posterior circulation to fix the aneurysm, but we're going to stent from the anterior circulation. And you can see here, there's a stent from P1 to P1, and then the aneurysm is completely coiled off. And then the follow-up run, the, um, you can see here the pre and post that both P1s are open, and there's not a lot of filling of the aneurysm. Mm -hmm. This aneurysm continued to grow, um, and it kept, you'd, you'd bring patients back and you'd say, okay, there's significant recanalization. What are our options here? And once you put a braided stent in an artery, it's very difficult to then put a flow diverter in. They just don't sit against the wall of the vessel properly and they don't properly endothelialize. So your chances of, of occlusion of that aneurysm drop from 90% with a flow diverter down to about 50% if there's already a braided stent in the aneurysm. 
There's different devices that have been made. Some of them are already off the market um, that were designed to deal with wide neck bifurcation aneurysms. Um, here's another device that's sort of a combination of a web and a coil called Medina. Again, some of these things are developed and made, but they never really come to clinical practice. The web device was made and it looks sort of like a, a marshmallow. It's an intrasacular device um, that goes in aneurysms. <clears throat> Uh, anywhere from three millimeters to about 12 millimeters. Here's a patient that presents with a subarachnoid hemorrhage due to a ruptured basilar. And here's the angiogram, both the lateral and the AP views. And then you can see here in this image, I hope that shows up for you, you can see that the web device is deployed nicely in that aneurysm. Here's a run, an angiogram. There's still some filling in the posterior dome of that aneurysm, even with the web device in there. And then here's the pre-3D uh, reconstruction of that aneurysm that we treated. It was sort of considered a, partially a wide neck aneurysm with the origin of the P1 incorporated into the base. But you can see how the web device sits. This little tail where you detach the device creates quite a bit of artifact on imaging. It looks like there's a big coil that's in the parent vessel, but it typically with just ASA will not cause a problem. Um, and then here's the follow-up at two months with a contrast enhanced MRA. And you see that there's very little filling. There's nice remodeling. Both PCAs are open and the patient's for the most part doing quite well. Um, when we look at, at, at the data from Webb, um, they show that treatment success is about 93%. There's some of the larger Webb devices require a really large microcatheter. And if there's angulation of the aneurysm from the parent vessel, it becomes quite difficult to deploy in certain aneurysms, especially ophthalmic aneurysms. Um, there seems to be low complication rates, but I'd say these complication rates are still higher than primary coiling. So I'm still a little bit cautious and selective of who gets a web device. Here's an artery that you can't use a web device because the entire artery is dysplastic. This is an ophthalmic aneurysm. It's symptomatic. The patient is losing vision in that eye. There's parent vessel sacrifice. Most people can tolerate occlusion of the ophthalmic artery without going blind. Probably 97% of people, you can sacrifice that ophthalmic artery and they won't lose their vision. It's supplied through external branches. But you can't really put coils into this aneurysm. This aneurysm can be clipped. Um, it's drilling a lot of the anterior clinoid process to be able to get a clip down around this neck. So it's quite a difficult surgery. From an endovascular approach, I'd say this is a perfect flow diverting stent case. Um, and flow diverting stents, as I said, have been around for almost 20 years in terms of use, clinical use at least 15 years, and we've grown and, and got a lot more experience. And the devices have evolved and gotten a lot more easy to use and deploy, um, and they're a little bit more predictable. Um, they're made out of different metal elements, mainly uh, cobalt and platinum. And there's different products on the market. So some of them have more than 48 strands. Some of them um, have 48, some have less. They're variation. Um, the initial studies that were done with a pipeline embolization device, the PUFFS trial, showed 83% of aneurysms were completely occluded at 12 months, which is a much higher rate than primary coiling. So primary coiling, you're lucky if you have complete um, a, a complete occlusion of the aneurysm in about 55 to 60 percent of coiled aneurysms. So you still have a, a fairly significant percent of aneurysms that aren't occluded and they're still filling and they sometimes continue to grow. The nice thing with these aneurysms is once they're occluded, when they're followed in the literature, it's incredibly rare that an aneurysm will ever recanalize after a pipeline is used. The follow-up data, the PETA trial showed very similar occlusion rates with flow diverters um, of, you know, in the high 90s. At 12 months, you have almost 95% occlusion of, of more complex aneurysms, really large aneurysms. The initial Canadian experience with pipeline was published, um, and I think it was more of an honest opinion of the use of the device. In those first two studies, the PUFFs and the PETA um, studies, they actually reported uh, fairly low complication rates, whereas the Canadian experience in the first 10 years of using the device, 
um, the complication rates were were more at about six to eight um, percent, including this phenomenon of ipsilateral distal territory hemorrhage um, that we were seeing. And we're seeing less of that. At one time, we thought it was maybe something to do with catheters that were being used, um, but it's less common. But these patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy, so it's it's always an increased risk of hemorrhage when you're treating somebody with flow diverters. The combined data from this, so there's a lot more patients, again, shows high occlusion rates of aneurysms using flow diverters. Um, the off-label use is distal aneurysms because there hasn't been studies or trials on distal aneurysms as well as blister aneurysms. So ruptured blister aneurysms, when I first started my fellowship, I saw a few surgical attempts at trying to wrap them. Um, I saw parent vessel sacrifice and trapping. Um, for us, from an endovascular standpoint, again, parent vessel sacrifice was typically what was done, especially if it was distal. You would just coil, occlude, or even use $50 treatment with glue and just occlude the vessel. Now we're seeing more um, development of smaller delivery systems, so smaller microcatheters, smaller flow diverters to treat these distal aneurysms. Um, and it's, I find it's quite successful in terms of the treatment. And again, you're not putting coils into the aneurysm, you're just remodeling the artery. There's several products out now that go through an 017 microcatheter um, and 021 microcatheters to be able to get out distally. When we first started using pipeline, they went through a larger 027 catheter and it was sometimes a struggle to get way out into an ACA branch with one of those catheters. Here's a patient I treated with a, an ACOM um, with a flow diverter and things went really well in terms of complete occlusion of the, of the aneurysm. And the, the initial uh, treatment with flow diverters is that they weren't to be used beyond the ophthalmic segment. Um, blister aneurysm. So we see a lot of these dissecting pseudo aneurysms, especially in the vertebral basilar system, sometimes in the ICA, um, there's some sort of arteriopathy that the patient might have. They're not usually caused by trauma. A few of them can be caused by trauma on the PCA with the tentorium, um, just with, with blunt head injury. But for the most part, they just occur because of an arteriopathy. And in children that are treated with flow diverters for blister aneurysms, it's typically things like varicella. We've had issues with COVID causing small pseudoaneurysms to develop. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few cases that I've done recently. Here's a 62 year old female that presents with three day history of recurrent falls. So she's um, had, having quite a bit of issues with ataxia. You can see from the CT scan that she has a very large lesion near the midbrain that's compressing quite a bit of her midbrain. Um, it looks like it's a giant basilar artery aneurysm, which our angiogram confirmed. <clears throat> and again, here's the angiogram. You can see how contrast just swirls around in this thing. A lot of them actually, because of that contrast swirling, will show up as partially thrombose. And there's a lot of mass effect and inflammation in the surrounding brain due to it being a partially thrombosed aneurysm. This aneurysm on MR and CT imaging didn't show any thrombosis. Um, but it showed complexity in terms of the branches coming out of the origin. We don't even see much opacification of the right PCA. We really see left PCA and SCA incorporated into the dome of the aneurysm. Again, there isn't a web device that's this big, primary coiling. There isn't a surgical option for it. So we felt that flow diverting um, and coiling would be a way to maybe halt this thing from continuing to grow. Unfortunately, you, you can almost tell the patient in terms of the natural history that they're not going to get better. They're going to continue to get worse. So what is the goal of treatment? Is it to decrease the risk of hemorrhage? We know from Ishua that the risk of that aneurysm rupturing is 50% in the next five years. She's 62, so she's going to, you have to have a long discussion with people before you treat them that she's going to continue to live with significant disability. And I think that's probably the best thing you can do for this patient is counsel them and their family on what's to come. We put in a flow diverter, we coiled this aneurysm, and we had just to only partially coil the aneurysm because you have to keep the branches at the base of the aneurysm open. So when, when you don't occlude an aneurysm and it still has flow into it, um, that's when they continue to grow. 
And so I, I sometimes ask myself, am I actually doing anything for this patient? Am I treating a picture or am I actually treating a problem? Um, this is the complexity of what we do. And sometimes you're not sure if the treatment that you're offering the patient is actually going to benefit them. Um, so we ended up deploying multiple flow diverters in this case and, and coiling this with roughly 50 coils. So um, it ends up being a very expensive treatment. Um, is it an effective treatment? That I'm not 100% certain. Um, I'll, I'll skip through to some of the final images. You can see now in the middle of the head, you have this huge coil mass. Um, there's the angiogram. You actually have better filling of both PCAs now. You can see the right and the left PCA. She's done reasonably well, um, but she's still very disabled. So we haven't really made her better. Um, she claims that she feels a little bit better cognitively, like a little sharper, but um, her mocha is still very bad. She scored 15 out of 30, so. Um, and then follow-up MRI, there's a few hits from the endovascular procedure, but you can see all that mass effect from the coil mass. Eventually you just keep compressing as it grows the midbrain and they become completely paralyzed. Uh, the thalamus becomes a big issue. So their level of consciousness, they, do, they just deteriorate over time. I'm gonna show you this uh, 67 year old male with an anterior circulation, giant parsley thrombosed aneurysm. And this is like the one that I showed you that Charles Drake had drawn uh, in his images. Um, you can see that it looks like a fusiform aneurysm of the left ICA, but what you're not seeing is the big thrombose sac on that reconstructed CTA. Um, so this is a giant aneurysm of the left supraclinoid ICA. It incorporates the ACOM, the PCOM, and a little bit of the anterior cerebral artery into it. And the patient's symptomatic. He's losing vision in the left eye. Here's the angiogram. Um, it's showing you the partially thrombosed filling part of the aneurysm. Um, but we know that this aneurysm is much bigger. There's mass effect on the, on the middle cerebral artery here, as well as the ACA. The whole artery is actually protruded superiorly. This is sort of just a cartoon image of where the thrombose sac is. So again, what are the goals of treatment when we treat these giant aneurysms? Is it to protect against rupture? That's what we think we're doing. Is it protecting against thromboembolic events? The patient is at risk with giant aneurysms, especially a thrombosed aneurysm of having a distal embolic event. And then can we improve the mass effect? He's losing vision. There is an optic chiasm compression here. Um, and can we prevent the aneurysm from growing further and starting to compress the internal capsule and making this patient hemiparetic? So here's our treatment strategy. We went with an endovascular treatment. Here's a flow diverter being deployed and we're doing telescopic flow diverters. So there's the first one deployed. Now we're deploying a second device. So now there's a lot of metal coverage right here where the main inflow of the aneurysm is in thrombose component. We have overlapping flow diverters. There's sort of that cartoon of the thrombose component. Here's the follow-up CTA after treatment one. You can see the flow diverter. You can see that there's less filling of the aneurysm, but it's still a lot. As long as there's still filling of that aneurysm, I don't think at 12 months and even 24 months, this aneurysm will be completely excluded from the circulation. Unfortunately, a few days later, the patient comes in with a new infarct. So new um, right-sided weakness from this left uh, small infarct. Repeat angiogram at six months shows persistent filling of the aneurysm. It's not really that different. And there's already two flow diverters in here. So our next steps were just continue to watch it. It's always the difficult part. He's had another stroke. He's on dual antiplatelet therapy. Put in another flow diverter. This is typically what a lot of people do with these giant aneurysms. Should we go back into the aneurysm from this image, um, oh, I'll show you in a sec, and try to coil occlude the filling part. But we, in order, you can't get across a flow diverter with a microcatheter to coil the aneurysm. So once you put a flow diverter, you're locked out of the aneurysm sac. In this case, you can see right here that 
as I said, it incorporates the anterior cerebral artery. So again, this is where we get fancy with endovascular techniques. And we're now going to do a transcirculation route coming from the opposite circulation through the anterior cerebral artery and back into this aneurysm to coil it. So that's what we do. There's the microcatheter. There's the coil mass. We've occluded that. We've kept the PCOM and the anterior choroidal artery open. We put in another flow diverter. The picture looks good. The patient's okay. The follow-up reconstructed image shows very little filling of the aneurysm. But the interesting thing on this patient is he still has a lot of mass effect from the aneurysm. And although you don't see filling on angiographic images, you see this thrombose mass getting bigger and bigger over time. You bring the patient back, you do a repeat um, angiogram, and you don't really see how the aneurysm is getting flow. So um, here's a 74-year-old male that presents with discoordination and dizziness. He has sudden onset hearing loss. He's got really no significant medical history. His left vertebral artery is occluded intracranially. And he has this really abnormal stenotic segment with these two aneurysm components that we think are a dissecting pseudoaneurysm. The CTA shows some calcification. So in terms of timing, this event probably happened quite some time ago. Why is he becoming symptomatic now? That's sort of the, the interesting thing with the natural history of these lesions. But you can see here that the pica comes right out of the origin of the pseudoaneurysm. There's a very stenotic segment. But this is an, a pica ica trunk, so his hearing loss was most likely from a thromboembolic event of the labyrinth artery from the ica. So goals of treatment in this case, again, pre pre prevent rupture. We know that pseudoaneurysms have a high risk of rupture, prevent further thromboembolic events, and improvement in vertebral basilar insufficiency because he's dizzy, and prevent aneurysm growth. So we started him on dual antiplatelets, we put in a single flow diverter. Here's the image, but you can see that the flow diverter, the difficulty with a flow diverter in this case is it doesn't have radial force. So it's not going to open. So you have to balloon the vessel open. So we do a follow up run after we balloon angioplasty with a three millimeter gateway. And what we've done is we've snow plowed part of the thrombus that's in the vessel wall because it's a dissection. And we've occluded the origin of the left pica. The pica is filling through collaterals, um, but we're not seeing the caudal loop. So this patient's going to have brainstem infarction if we don't do something. So our option at that point was to do another angioplasty and inflate to a much higher uh, atmosphere with the with the balloon way beyond its nominal pressure to open this vessel. We gave integralin, we increased the blood pressure to try to get flow, and we restored flow into this pica. I think we got very lucky. Um, the final images show that there's flow. It's a little bit sluggish in that pica. Um, and then his follow-up imaging, there's really just, there was only one small little infarct, but what you see here is that the pica is still filling. Um, I think I'll stop there. Um, yeah. It can be a beautiful case, we could continue, but if we want to eat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I um, think we would like to probably get some questions from the audience, but I think yeah. it's a fantastic case. We are, we're going to be back. <laughs> there's, there's so many cases, but I mean, I focused on cases in the posterior circulation. Um, so here's a gentleman that I'll just quickly show you this, presents with a large stroke, right homonymous hemianopsia. His left P1 is completely occluded. He has this complex basilar trunk aneurysm. Again, you can see where this is going. It's flow diversion time. So we flow diverted the, the lesion. Um, and that patient's done fairly well. I think it's, it's a robust treatment for a basilar trunk aneurysm like that. Um, another patient with a ruptured basilar aneurysm um, Again, a complex aneurysm. And what you see here is that the definition of basilar trunk is really something that starts from the VB junction to the SCA. And then the basilar apex would be from the SCA to the P1. So this is both a basilar trunk and a basilar apex aneurysm, but it's a complete dysplastic vessel. 
The problem with putting a flow diverter in here, you can't really put coils because all of the perforators come off of the posterior wall of the of the basilar artery. So if you coil this off, you're gonna, the patient's never gonna wake up. If you just put a flow diverter in there and promote thrombosis, you're gonna cause infarcts. Again, what do you do? The patient's ruptured. There isn't really a surgical option. Pardon? Reverse the flow. Reverse the flow, yeah. If there's PCOMs. Yeah. Unfortunately, there isn't really PCOMs. So flow diverter was put in. Here's the run. You can see that it creates some stasis in the aneurysm. Um, but over time, what's happened to this individual is there's progressive thrombosis of the aneurysm. There's some changes in the PCA that are happening, but he continues to present with perforator infarcts every few weeks. So as this aneurysm is thrombosing, um, he keeps coming back with new perforator infarcts, and you can see them in the brainstem, right in the midbrain. Um, and the most recent one, the perforator infarcts are actually more devastating. So I don't really think there was a treatment option for this patient. Um, there wouldn't be an open surgical option. Can't really coil this. I think flow diversion was really the only option. And it's counseling the patient that they're going to continue to have strokes. Um, this is our imaging protocol for our treated aneurysms for flow diverters. We either use contrast enhanced MRA or CTA. CTA usually the next morning after treatment to say as a baseline, MRI helps to tell us if we've caused infarcts. There's pluses and minuses to both. Unruptured intracranial aneurysms, always MRA time of flight. For some coiled aneurysms, eventually once they show stability, you can stop using gadolinium. We probably have a very similar protocol to what you're using here. Um, I think I'll just stop and take questions. Oh yeah, that's been well published. Um, Charles Matuk, who did his fellowship in Toronto, um, has published on this. Um, yeah, so I said that 20 to 30% of patients will have multiple intracranial aneurysms. And when someone comes in with multiple aneurysms that are on arteries, what I would classify as Wallisian vessels, so PCOMs, ACOMs, supraclinoid ICA, and you can't really figure out which one's ruptured, we will do vessel wall imaging. Um, I think it's probably a little bit more sensitive and specific using 3T over 1.5, but for, for our center, we only have a 1.5. So for really small aneurysms, sometimes it's not helpful, but if they really light up the dome of the aneurysm, usually what you're seeing is an inflamed vasovasorum of the aneurysm. So that was considered in giant aneurysms when you use contrast enhanced MRA and you see the whole vessel wall enhance that the aneurysm is still alive and growing. For small ruptured aneurysms, yes, if you see vessel wall enhancement, you could maybe say that's the culprit lesion. Typically, what we do is we treat all of them endovascularly. If you're not sure which one ruptured, uh, based on the pattern of subarachnoid hemorrhage, then you're sort of obliged to treat them all. So you would treat as many as you can in one setting endovascularly, and if some of them have to be clipped, I've seen where we've clipped an MCA and coiled an ACOM and Vice versa. So, you will see actually the animal grow. Yeah. Today, it's red, and so then we 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 use the same thing. Yeah. It's very useful, and we are starting a project with Sharma Joanna from the Western. I'm looking at the after that because that's important. And that's how they evolve over time. Yeah. Uh, with uh, with uh, MRI. It's true, but uh, I have experience with both 1.5 and 3P. The 3P is night and day. Yeah, the, I have that one diagram that. Um... Right. It's interesting what you said about 
but the inverse is under last year, we're seeing a simple industrial survey of these fellow observers are going to be trading and doing like four left angles to this entire thing. Yeah. So it's a bit concerning, like we're kind of approached the end of the last track below, everything was going that red, but surveys are not being trained on the companies. And we do that number of left angles in terms of like the um and there's very few centers in North America that offer a combined um when I trained in London my co-fellow was a neurosurgeon and she did both um so the training was both open and endovascular um but yeah it definitely for our residents they it's the residents from both radiology neurosurgery neurology typically are invited to neurovascular rounds and the neurovascular rounds are run by the whole neurointerventional team and all of the vascular neurosurgeons are there um, as well as some of the other neurosurgeons and stroke neurologists but having multidisciplinary rounds where these things are discussed routinely um, I think one of our senior older neurosurgeons was quite um, bothered in a recent OSCE exam when he showed a vascular case that the majority of the neurosurgery residents, when he asked, how are you going to manage this? He, they all said, I'm going to consult the neurointerventional team. And he, he said that was not the answer that he wanted to hear. So he's, even though they're not actually doing the surgery and, and seeing as many clippings, they still need to be able to logically think through um, and understand aneurysm, you know, angioarchitecture, natural history. Um, and management of subarachnoid, but it's the 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 fellows that um, really want to learn to clip. They go to places like Brazil and the Philippines, where it's that's all it's done. Yeah, we still love what we are going to analysis and also we still do quite a bit. I personally don't love to create the MCA analysis with Carly because I don't think it's real life. From the work of Dr. Bray himself. Yeah. And uh, we did one yesterday because, you know, sometimes you have a good one. So I think so there is a better, but we still do it some year, but certainly we find more problems in the last year. Yeah. Marker, you have a situation in the last four year old woman on permanent for pulmonary illness has a summer at my hemorrhage. Yes, successfully confirmed for a common MCA. When, and since boils actually from both your aneurysms happen, what's the safe window for the hypothyroidism? Usually, even for patients that are inpatients, they would be started on DVT prophylaxis within 48 hours, but then restarting. Yeah, there's lots of patients that come in that are. That have a history of atrial fibrillation, they need to be re anticoagulated. Even if there's a little bit of filling in an aneurysm on MR, the, as we said, the, a lot of those small remnants, they don't re rupture. So it's, I think it's the primary problem. If pulmonary embolism is going to be a big problem, then anticoagulating soon after treatment. Because the problem is the brain in the patient's head. Yes. <laughs> but I actually, in Probably in the last 20 years, I've only seen one patient with a ruptured aneurysm that was on Coumadin with an INR of three. Most people that are on anticoagulation and rupture their aneurysm, those are that rule of thirds, the ones that are found at home passed away. But restarting anticoagulation after any treatment like that should be fairly soon after if the clinical need is there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a very eloquent uh, presentation, Brian. Uh, and this is a bit of a tough question. One of the things I struggle with, and I think you've shown that on the presentation, is science is often behind some products. Um, and it's always a balance between pushing what we think we can go 
and then going into the area of exploitation of being terrorists. And uh, I wonder how you try to find that balance. Uh, I, I've always struggled with it, and I think I always will struggle with it. And I wonder how you approach things to avoid the economy of the under treating or over treating God. Yeah, I think trying to understand natural history, the more you see and, and what these things do to patients when you don't treat them um, versus what you think the treatments, how they're going to benefit them. It is a delicate balance when you're treading, you know, unfamiliar waters. But um, like some of the cases I've showed you, um, I don't know what the outcome would be in some of those patients if they didn't have treatment. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think it's a field because it's a device driven field for the most part and the devices are constantly evolving um, that there's, you know, that onus on you to stay up on how these things are performing and if they can do something better than what you're currently working with. But at the same time, the balance of knowing who to use them in. Um, I, I find that that's the most difficult part of the, the, the simple aneurysms that have a clear cut treatment path. They've either come in ruptured um, or they're rapidly growing and they have a cranial neuropathy. We then sort of figure out, okay, if they have a symptomatic lesion. What is the best way to treat it? I find those easier than the completely asymptomatic large aneurysms that you then subject to treatment. That's the group that, especially as they get older, we typically, the reason why EVT, which I'll talk about tomorrow, I found difficult when I first started is because when I was a fellow, it was incredibly rare that anyone over the age of 70 was ever on the angio table. We, in London, we never coiled the 70 year old person. We let, we would say that their natural history, their life expectancy is, we should just leave them alone. Now I think things are changing. We we do put older patients on the table. But uh, as I said, I, I, I'm cautious. I'm still conservative. If I don't think I'm meeting natural history, I still think I have no business touching it. Because even if you, if you think you can do something and there's some new device out that you think, okay, I could easily deploy this web without doing all these coils, there's lots of things that can happen with these new devices. Uh, there's a learning curve for everything. And then how do you justify sort of, I see some of the centers in Europe um, doing things that I, I question whether, you know, in, in we don't do that in Canada. Um, like <clears throat> they're more almost experimental treatments. I think it's our experience too. We're very conservative. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Okay. It's a difficult question to answer. So, well, any other question? I think it's um, time to thank you very much. Oh. For